I was reading the sports pages of the Miami Herald and the Miami News. I was I was picking winners in the horse races at Tropical Park near my house. Uh, and uh, and growing as a sports fan all the time. And somewhere along that way, I I read in the newspaper in Miami that um, Cassius Clay was moving toward fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world. And that if he happened to fight Sonny Liston for the title, it was logical and likely that that fight would take place at the Miami Beach Convention Center. And I learned that uh, Angela Dundee was training Cassius Clay at a place called the Fifth Street Gym on Miami Beach. And I two or three times encouraged my mother and convinced my mother to drive us the 30 miles from our crappy tracked house home in Southwest Miami to Miami Beach to the Fifth Street Gym to try to watch Angelo Dundee training um, Cassius Clay. He was still Cassius Clay at the time. And uh, in those trips, I never actually saw him train Cassius Clay. We didn't time it right. I watched him train a Cuban welterweight named Luis Rodriguez. I watched him train a uh, middleweight champion named Willie Pastrano. Never got a chance to see him train Clay. But when the Liston Clay fight was made, I saved lawn mowing and car washing money for months to buy a ticket to go to that fight, uh, which in my memory cost $100. It might have cost $150. I did not save the ticket. That was stupid. <laughs> um, but I did go to the fight. My mother dropped me off outside the Miami Beach Convention Center. I went in with my one ticket. Uh, I watched the fight alone. My hero beat Liston. Uh, in the biggest upset in heavyweight history to that time. We came back home and I got up on the roof of my house screaming, I've upset the world. I'm the greatest of all time, et cetera, et cetera. And so my mother came out and said, get down off the roof. You're going to get us both arrested. Um, so, you know, those are my memories on the road to becoming a, um, a big boxing fan. And uh, again, a lot of it had to do with what Cassius Clay, eventually Muhammad Ali represented. He taught me a lot of lessons. Um, I was I was devastated. I was really disturbed when I read three days after the Liston fight that he had changed his name. Um, but I learned from that. I I learned that uh, his identity as a man and as a fighter was his and not mine. Uh, and no matter how much I loved him and revered him, I didn't own him. That was an important lesson. Uh, as a teenager, he taught me my position on the Vietnam War. I, uh, my father had been a military hero in World War II. I couldn't have conceived the idea of being against a war. But from Ali, I learned enough about Vietnam and particularly, um, you, know, you, you know, the great line, no Viet Cong, ever called me the n-word uh and uh, and so he taught me that and uh and i can honestly say i think he taught me a lot of things uh as we went along uh on route to uh, on route to finally meeting as human beings once i was calling fights on hbo yeah i i, I want to stay on the muhammad ali topic uh i heard a story that uh there was one time uh you had something to do I believe it was in New York and you were with your daughter and you had nobody to stay with her. And Muhammad Ali told you, go do what you got to do. And he stood with your daughter for a few hours until you went and did what you had to do and come back. Uh, well, you're very well schooled. Uh, and yes, I'm, I'm glad you know that story. Hold on just a second. No problem. Ah, yes. Uh -oh, just a little bit more. To your, right, I'm, I'm no, no, the other way. The other way. There we go. Um, there. Maybe. Uh, where in the hell you, is? You don't have to tilt it. Thing. Don't tilt it. You never there figure it out. But there you go. Uh, yeah. That's but, obviously Muhammad on the right. That's me in the center, and that is my daughter Brooke uh, on the left. And that photo was taken uh, on that night in 1988 when he babysat her for. There you go. I'm tilting it forward. Get a much better look. Yeah. Yes. When he babysat her uh, for yeah, a couple, couple or a few hours 
I want to say three hours while I went out and ran errands on extremely busy day in the streets of Manhattan. And I, um, you know, I, when I was riding home with her in the cab at the end of the evening, back to her mother's house on uh, the Upper East Side, she asked me, um, she was, she was eight at that moment. And she asked me, she said, dad, who was that man? And I said, well, um, that's a long story. And as you grow older, you will certainly learn it. You'll read about him. You'll, you'll know everything eventually. Uh, but uh, for tonight, I'll send you to bed with just one observation, which is um, he is unquestionably, indisputably, the most famous man in the world. And uh, she was properly impressed by that. Uh, and I think that that experience, along with a lot of others, helped to give my daughter her um, very powerful and unique sense of self. And uh, she's now global chairman of fine art sales for Sotheby's Auction House. Uh, and I used to say of Brooke, Brooke Lampley that she uh, is the most uh, influential art executive her age in the world. And nowadays, um, I don't use the words her age. She's the most influential art sales executive in the world. And certainly experiences like that one with Muhammad, probably primarily that one with Muhammad, but going to Olympics with me in Sarajevo and Barcelona and Atlanta and uh, Beijing and meeting um, gold medal winners and uh, famous stars, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in those experiences also helped her to recognize that, you know, she um, was capable of touching greatness and she was capable of being great. And uh, I think at the end of the day, when all is said and done, uh, we'll probably say that Brooke was even greater at what she did than her famous father.